We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. We're here today with Dan Breezy from Granite Towers Equity Group. And Granite Towers Equity Group, he was just telling me uh, he is based in Washington State and they own and actually in my back door, which seems to be a recurring theme on this podcast, is Nashville, Tennessee. So uh, Dan, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. Excited to be here with you guys. Absolutely, man. We're always glad to get new and fresh perspectives and to hear what people have going on in their real estate world. So tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and how you got started in the real estate business. Yeah, definitely. So I grew up in central Minnesota, had this childhood dream of trying to become a professional snowboarder, Moved out <laughs> west after high school. Yeah, everyone basically told me I was crazy. Asked me what my backup plan was my entire life, you know, ninth through 12th grade. My comment was, I don't have a backup plan. This is going to work. And uh, yep. committed, moved to Salt Lake City. Um, worked some odd jobs for four years. Blockbuster, Payway, Red Lobster. Parents never gave me any money, but said, we support you. You can do it. Go for it. Um, grinded for four years, finally went to Aspen, Colorado, entered an open, it was 250 bucks. I was so broke. My friend drove me to Aspen from Salt Lake city and I won that contest. There were like 275 people there. And that was kind of the beginning of my snowboarding career. So I had a snowboarding career for 13 years, traveled all over the world, rode for some of the brands that you know, maybe a lot of your listeners know of GoPro, Rockstar, Volcom. Um, ended up winning a couple X Games gold medals, a couple silver medals. Um, ended up being nominated number three rider in the world uh, by my peers for Snowboarder Magazine. And just had a kind of a dream come true. But midway through my career, um, I got to know a lot of my childhood friends and they were older. And they started to get to a point where they needed to wind their career down. And in all honesty, it was pretty brutal. It was scary. They were losing their homes and bankruptcy and cars. And it was it was scary. So seeing that, I realized I needed to do something different. So I started to look for ways to invest the money that I was making and trying to find a way to legally reduce my tax bill. So ended up start buying apartments, started with a small nine unit deal here in Chehalis, Washington, just north about an hour and a half of where I live now. Then I bought a duplex on my own 2012. And then I bought a 24 unit on my own. And at that time, I could see the cash flow, depreciation, the control, you know, the uh, the loan pay down by my tenants. And I, I got pretty excited about what you could do and how far you could take it. So I reached out to a really good friend at the time, childhood friend I grew up with named Mike Roder, lives in Minnesota, I've known him my whole life, started snowboarding with the guy. And he was buying uh, single family homes. He was on his way to try to buy 100 homes. He was doing well in his insurance sales business, selling high net worth insurance to, to uh, high net worth clients. So we bought a property together in 2015, a 28 unit deal. We realized what we could do. We both really liked it. We ended up getting more detailed training in 2017. And we started Granite Towers Equity Group in 2017. And now we're a full-time syndication um, private investment business. We buy A, B, and C class value add apartments, 100 to 400 units, uh, Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, and Nashville, Tennessee. So that's kind of the story. Awesome, man. Uh, I, I would like to point out, we do know you're from Minnesota because you said a boat. Um, <laughs> you're not that far separated from that, that, ac that part of the accent anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, my wife always makes fun of me when I say the word bag. She's like, it's not a bag, it's a bag. So it's, it's a uh, bag. <laughs> hard to get that hard to get that out of my mouth correctly. But uh, I got yeah. you. It's all good, man. We know what it is. We speak all kinds of languages on here. So as long <laughs> as it's as long as it's the language of making money, we don't care what it actually sounds like. So um, but so so you know, you you went into 
it's like so many people, you started out with just a few deals on your own. You were able to take down, you know, like you said, a 24 unit complex and some other stuff now. Um, so, so it's interesting. What the part of this story that's interesting to me is probably going to be not what you necessarily expect because obviously, uh, Granite Towers has grown and you all have, have had several acquisitions and, and things are going forward. But the part of the story that really intrigues me because I can relate to it and I, I, I'm sure that most of the listeners can at some point in their life was that you actually had the foresight to take some of the money that you were making and not necessarily focus on, hey, I'm making this much money, but you took the money that you were making and you invested it into something that cash flows. And when we talk about cash flows, basically you're just saying, hey, I'm going to take this money and rather than taking it all right now, I'm going to put it somewhere where I can take it out in an even in an even basis. Plus, on top of that, you get the tax benefits. And the tax benefits, again, as uh, they're, 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 it's a double-edged sword because they're great up front. They can bite you on the rear unless you do a 1031 exchange, which we all know they're looking at doing uh, some different things with. I'm sure the, if this administration gets its way, they would just do away with it completely. But um, the bottom line being that that you had the foresight to take some of what you were making, and I'm assuming was pr- what, which what was pretty good money. I, I'm assuming, and putting it into something that you can take out a little bit at a time. So tell us a little bit about like like that light bulb obviously went off at a cert- at a specific time, but then did you just go to like a local bank to finance the balance? I mean, what did all that look like? Yeah, no, yeah, that realization that again, seeing those those guys crash and burn. I just knew is for a, some of those guys were way more successful than me, or at least I thought they were making way more and had a longer career. And uh, seeing that, I kind of dove into Rich Dad Poor Dad and a bunch of those yeah, books, sure. and, and just, yeah, started reading every book I could find on apartment investing. Um, but I just knew that the funds you're making as an athlete, as a doctor, as your income—that's just the beginning. That's the first half. The next step is, is how do you use those funds to pay you money? If you want to have freedom and you want to have freedom of time, you have to find a way to collect income without working, you know, and passive income money while you sleep, uh, really grabbed my attention. As soon as I stopped snowboarding, as soon as I stopped riding, if I took six months off, my brands pretty much were like, are you going to continue or are you fired? You know, income high to income zero not much control, not much certainty there, not much freedom. You know, as much as I love snowboarding and a man, I loved it. It was everything. It was my passion. It's obvious. I mean, it's obvious that you had a, had a burning desire and passion to, and that's what a lot of people, people that see athletes on TV, like you said, you want X games medals and so on. And, you know, and, and people, they used to talk about Kobe Bryant. They talk about Kobe Bryant calling Michael Jordan at 3 a.m. wanting to know about footwork. Like, what can I do to, 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 to make my footwork better? And that's what a lot of people miss out. They miss that whole element of, man, these people eat, sleep, dream, breathe, talk, these sports. And I can I can hear that in your voice when you talk about snowboarding. Yeah, that is and how it's it obviously was. It was you know, something that you... Yeah. Yeah. Growing up in Minnesota, I would snowboard with my friends and man, they, they just didn't really care that much. And I would be obsessively talking about it and they'd be like, Oh my gosh, Dan change the record. Like we went snowboarding all day. Let's do something else. And that just didn't resonate with me. And then when I finally got to the level of being a pro and I was around a bunch of other guys who were getting paid, um, they were all just like me. They're all, that's all they talked about. That's all they thought about. That's all they wanted to do. So you're right. There's an obsessive Kind of nature that um, is needed to get to that top top level and over a five to ten year period of obsessively focusing and basically nothing's going to stop you kind of attitude and most every one of the guys that I got to know well ha- had that and and uh, I think that's the goal is how, how can you carry that into whatever you do it seems to me like if you're ever going to do anything great there has to be a certain level of, of obsession and I know that I hear it all the time when you need balance you got to have balance and I I hear what they're saying, and I think that that's good for some people, potentially. But that's not going to get you to the top of anything um, if you have balance with and you do a bunch of things well. You know, I, I, I'm more of the pick the one thing and do one thing well. And even with multifamily, when we got into it, we looked at storage, we looked at office, we looked at retail, and and we really just came back and said, what's the one asset class 
A, B, and C class value add apartments. It was even just B and C class value add for the first four or five years. And now we've seen opportunity to get into A class and still even add some value, you know, buying a 2015, 2016 deal. You can still do some things to tweak rent and maybe reduce expenses. So just laser focusing in on one thing for a long period of time has been something that's worked well for me. And it seems to work well for a lot of the people who I, I admire with what they're doing. Sure, sure. And it's obvious that it's it's carried over from from your snowboarding career to to the real estate business. And and when you when you're and that's again, that's what I I've read so many books and everybody talks about uh you know, digging in on that one thing. Like people want to be popular on all these social media platforms, okay? Well, get popular on one first. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. go go all the way to the core of the earth on one of them, work your way back out, and then you can take on the rest of them. And I think we all have seen people like Grant Cardone and so on do just that. They got really popular in public speaking and that being his social arena was public speaking and, and, and podcasting really, or whatever it was in the beginning, but public speaking mainly. And then he started to take on the other channels. And as he's taken on channels, then you get to read because everybody wants to go in and repurpose content and do it all right now, but they never really get really good at any one thing. So yeah. that's, I think that's a very, very, very good lesson, especially for listeners who, who are maybe newer in the business or coming in, pick your asset class, pick your geography, pick your operator, pick your, whatever it is you're going to pick and go. And I think a lot of people are, are apprehensive about that because they're like, okay, what if I get, what if I get two feet in and then find out that this isn't my horse? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, So for sure. For sure. And, you know, kind of circling back to what you brought it up of, of how where was the foresight to invest the money versus and spend it and buy a big home and a big car. The simple thought process to run through your mind, if you're young, you're just starting out, or maybe you're in a career. The part that got me was, let's just say I was making 500,000 as a snowboarder. You're not making millions as a snowboarder. You're making middle, middle six figure to up to a million potentially is kind of sure. like the top level. But my mind was, okay, if I spend all this money now, I earned it and it's gone and it's over. But if yep. I earn this money now and invest it and I spend what it pushes back to me, I always have those funds, ideally, as long as you put it into a great asset. So you got to have a little bit of delayed gratification, you know, just money being earning money. It, it really resonated with me when I read, when I read just making a high level of income doesn't make you wealthy. It just makes you yep. having a lot of cash. Yep. If you can create a lot of residual income, passive income that's paying you from your dollars invested, now you're actually a free person. You you actually have more, a lot more power, a lot more wealth because your yep. 500, let's say you were going to make that year is now in an asset that you still own and control that's paying you and multiplying. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the most prime examples that comes to mind when we talk about this stuff is, you know, you see they're, they're one of the, one of the athletes that I've followed from basically like first tying on first tying up his first basketball shoes through today in current times is Shaquille O'Neal. And one of the things that you, that, that, that he has brilliantly done is he has, so everybody talks about how many car washes this man owns, how many five guys burgers this guy owns, how many, how many different fran- Papa, whatever, uh, I don't even know if it's Papa, whatever franchises that he owns. And I think what he's doing is, is he's using his likeness and he's using his ability and his, his, uh, his ability to, to magnetize people and bring the attention to him surely by being a giant human. And what he's doing is, is I think that this is what I think he's doing. Again, this guy could be completely way off on this, but I think what he's doing, like, for instance, he's approaching five guys and saying, Hey, I'll be your spokesperson. I'll be the main face of whatever, but rather than you pay me in cash today, I want, uh, I think they said he owns like 50 something, maybe 50 something different franchises of, of five guys, burgers and fries. And so, and I, again, this is all social media stuff that I read, but, but what he's doing is, is he's using his likeness to increase his cash flow. 
and that's that's the whole thing. He's 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 not taking cash right now today. He's saying, hey, you give me this many franchises, I'll be the sp- spokesperson and the 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 likeness figure for the whole business. But I don't want the cash now. I want the cash flow. Yeah, I think that's and, the way to measure measure your 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 income too. Is is what's your passive income each month? That's, that's the right. number I'm more focused on. You know, we might close a deal or it might have some sort of big bonus and have a big month of income. And I used to get really excited about that. And now I'm like, okay, great. That's just more to put into the next deal. What can it do for your passive income? What can it do for your residual income? Yeah. And that, and again, and that same, that same sentiment holds true throughout, through all of the, you go get the, go get the list of, 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 uh, the 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 billionaires in the United States. I think mean, how many is long? What 100, 150 people have a billion dollars plus in the United States. And when you look at every single one of them, like Warren Buffett can't go put his hands on however many eighty billion in cash, like cold hard cash. Some of that is being measured off of what he's churning in on the passive side. And, and, and then they're using the return and they're multiplying it out saying, okay, Hey, here's his net worth because he could, he brings an X amount of dollars a month, which is worth this much in real time. And so it's the same scenario that you're looking at when you talk about what you did and how you, how you kind of got your start. And, and then really on top of that, now you've kind of multiplied that into saying, Hey, not only am I going to use my money to create passive income, now I'm going to go raise capital and use other people's money to help them and me create passive income and wealth. And, uh, and in the meantime, you know, create these, these, uh, these companies that have multifamily uh, apartment complexes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's so a huge piece. Guess, yep. Yeah. That's a huge piece. I just I'd want like to touch that. on it. Real quick. You brought an idea up in my mind. Yeah. Is yeah, that yeah. You start raising, yeah. You start raising money from other people. You're basically helping them preserve their capital. A lot of these people that we invest with make really good money. And right now everyone knows the word inflation is eating away savings accounts at a more rapid pace than we've seen since what the seventies, eighties. So Five, it's been, I mean, fif- what, 15% in six months Yeah, it's or something insane. like that. I mean, so yeah, somehow it's not it, good. It's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. And these assets when bought right. And when you add value, you are on the side of inflation. It's, it's hedging. It's basically preserving your capital. So the more people that we can go along with us, the more capital preservation you're going to have. You know, I mean, my parents worked their tails off nine to five my entire childhood life and just retired at 67, 70 years old. And now they're 77 and they've recently been investing with us. And it's just been something that I really think we can move the needle on to help them live a more comfortable retirement in the sense that if they hadn't had that or didn't have this, their lives would be getting smaller and smaller, quicker and quicker because the money that sure. they saved would be being destroyed. It's it's kind of actually really a sad, sad place to be. Yeah. And I'm always I'm always um taken aback by how much as real estate syndicators and capital raisers, how much disclosure we have to give and how little disclosure the people in the stock market have to give um when it comes to to because again you look at, you know, look at any, any asset class you want to, whether it be stocks, whether it be hard assets, whether it be vehicle, whatever investments you've made. And, uh, you know, we have to disclose, 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 just like folks, your parents there, you have to disclose to them, well, you could lose it. Well, you could lose it. Well, you always have the dirt, you know, you always have some value there, some type of way you have some value. And, and when in fact a stock could go to zero or below zero if if they have depending upon their liabilities, but that neither neither here nor there. That's that's just such a wonderful way to put it. And and so to get people in to invest is capital preservation. When you're investing, you're not necessarily even if you're not investing for the for the specified return or the hopes of making the specified return, and you're investing for nothing more than preservation. And that's preservation against inflation. That's preservation of the capital balance so that you don't just go off and spend it. Um, and there's so many different ways to look at that and, and trying to, to make everybody's situation kind of come in and, and uh, work and help you, 
you help you raise capital. So tell us a little bit about, or should we say a boot? I don't know how, I don't know how, what the best way to, to get that to you. <laughs> it's either about or a boot, but tell us, uh, tell us about uh, like your first capital raise and your first deal that, that came to fruition through raising capital and, and, and going down that path. Yep. Our first deal was a small 45 unit deal out in River Falls, Wisconsin, just east of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. We'd been looking for probably 15 months after we went through a pretty rigorous training uh, with our mentor that we hired. Um, You know, we thought we knew multifamily, thought we knew what we were doing, but before we wanted to raise capital, we wanted to work with somebody who had been doing it with at least a 20 year track record and had been through the great recession and survived and thrived. Um, whenever sure. we're picking somebody to learn from, we want to find somebody who's already got the results and we can verify that the results are Absolutely. proven. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You can make so many mistakes in investing. You might as well just ask somebody how they did it when you know that it's successful and ideally get that information before you go out and start raising money. So that deal was a yeah. 15 month thing of looking. Yep. It was a 45 unit deal. The raise was $575,000. And I remember thinking this is going to be very challenging and I'm not sure if we'll be able to get it done. And it was literally two days. I mean, it's a very small raise, obviously, but we think we brought in 15 or 20 investors, 25 to 50 grand a pop. Um, some of them put in 100 and uh, it was a pretty small group. And we ended up actually selling that deal 24 months later for 4.1 million. So we bought it for 2.1 million. We put in 575 grand of upgrades, Double which was basically a new, yeah, new parking lot, new siding, new windows. Um, a couple uh, common area interior upgrades, and we just moved rents 250 bucks a unit because the people who owned it we were a group of 75 year old people that were kind of ready to be done and didn't have any capital to upgrade the property. And, and it did need some love. The siding, when we got there, we pushed our finger right through the siding. So the property needed some love. And once we solved that, sure. put on new siding throughout the whole property, um, the value totally changed and rents went up, cash flow went up, and we all did very well. And that was. That was 2018 when we bought that deal. So not really okay. too long ago. So two things about that, that I want to dig into, we're going to go and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and mention both things so that we can take one and then we'll come back and take the other. The first thing being, where did the deal come from? How did you find the deal? And the second thing being, where were your investors? Were they 506B, 506C? And depending upon which one they were, how did you how did you find people to invest? Because five seventy five, you're right, that's not a massive raise, but in my opinion, for your first raise, you had a massive amount of investors uh, to make up that five seventy five. So where did you find them? And obviously, we know that 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 you put together a pitch deck and so on in order to bring them over. But how did you get the cold investors? Yeah. First question uh, where we found the deal is through a broker. We find 95% or even 99% of our deals through broker relationships. Um, We're not out, you know, sending mail and cold calling and trying to get these off market deals. We're working with team members in our markets and building relationships with those team members over a long period of time to build trust so that when a great deal does come out and they need someone to close, we can be one of their top go-to buyers. So ideally that puts us in a position to see the best. Do you deals. keep a lot of cash or keep a lot of reserve, keep a lot of capital call reserves in place in order to, when, when you get a call like that to underwrite it quickly and be able to say, Hey, we'll close in 30 days. No, we'll, we generally are not closing in 30 days. Most of the time it's a 60 day close with a couple week extensions, depending on the debt market. The mar- debt market right now is very challenging and it's, it's not the quickest and easiest to get stuff done. So we're we're not a hurry up and, and, and rush through with cash to close or anything like that. It's, you know, Fannie, Freddie, bridge lending, um, sometimes bank recourse. We're just doing a, a partial bank recourse loan. And that one was a quicker close, but most of the time it's 60 days. And yeah, we, we definitely keep some cash reserves in order to be sure that we can handle the asset we're going to chase. And and obviously you got to decide how much do you want to be after at once right now we're seeing more deals than we've probably ever seen. And I think we're going to continue to see that trend up over the next 12 months as rates continue to run. Um, so we're, we're basically cautiously optimistic, cherry picking the ones that may, meet our criteria. So that's that, but that's how we're finding these deals is through broker and broker relations. And then your next question you asked was, it was a 506B or a 506C. We've done only 506Bs. These are all pre-existing relationships that we've spent time going to 
seminars or meetups or just talking about what we're doing and sharing with friends and family and um, the database gl- slowly grows. You know, we've been pretty active sure, in that sure, sure. building building our database since 2016, 2017, really hard. And we go to a lot of events. We are consistently there. We buy deals that are have done solid returns and consistently produce solid cash flow. That helps a lot with referrals. So it's been all 506B. Awesome, man. That's that's great. And it seems like when I first started, I thought, man, people would be crazy to do a 506B. It just seems so difficult. But then, but then when you start digging in in a bunch of different ways and seeing what folks like yourself are doing and how you've leveraged those relationships in order to, to raise capital from people that you know, it's just, man, it's, it's really like, it's just intriguing to me. Um, and, and the fact that, that, that you've been able to, to procure those relationships and, and make that deal happen. So on, uh, so let's talk a little bit. So the broker relationships now, obviously you being in Washington state and let's just, for instance, let's, let's pick out Nashville just because it's close to me. Um, how do you like, do you just, how big is your list of brokers that you, that you call on, that you follow up with, that you, that you make sure you stay at the top of their list in order to, to get a call when something comes up? Yeah, I'd say there's probably uh, 20 to 30 that we're really pretty well connected with between Dallas, Fort Worth and Nashville, Tennessee. But of those 20 or 30, I would say five or 10, we know really well. And then probably three to five that we've done a lot of deals with. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting that you have a lot of broker relations, but it seems like once you start to buy with one or two brokers, they kind of end up being your go-to, or at least that's how it's been for us. Um, so, and then, you know, building those relationships, we've spent a lot of time in these markets flying in and being there and touring deals and underwriting deals and communicating with these brokers. And then when you, when you put a deal under contract, just do what you say you're going to do. And a big part of doing that right is being educated. So when you put an LOI in, you already know 95% of what's probably going to happen during that transaction. And if you don't know that and you aren't confident in that, you're likely going to try to retrade. And obviously a retrade on a price can can damage your reputation. There's a lot more happening now or so I hear in the market with the debt market changing so quickly. You know, but one thing we try to do is when we do submit an LOI, it may not be the highest or best price, but the broker knows that it's going to you know be a pretty dang certainty of close on what we're putting on paper. Yeah. And and if you can tie, I've noticed too, that, it, that if you can tie up some of the loose ends, that's going to be the equivalent to the seller of that. Just to, it's going to be the same equivalent to the seller as if you were raising the purchase price. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it some, something you can't quantify, like maybe mm-hmm. say, you know, you're going to, you already have all your debt and ever you already have all your money lined up or just whatever the case is. And that may be worth something more to the seller than taking a little bit more from somebody else who's like, eh, well, we're going to go apply for these loans. And so that's the kind of stuff that if you can tie up a lot of those loose ends prior to, you have a far better chance of getting a little bit better deal and being able to, to serve your investors a little bit better deal on the return side too. Um, mm-hmm. So those bro, yeah, and I, I've got to imagine that once you get in there and you start closing in one of the one of the markets, that that people hear about that stuff too, and brokers talk. and And it took me from the real estate sales perspective, it took me a long time to figure out that that hey, these these big commercial guys, they talk, they they network, they conference, they do a lot of stuff together, and uh, although names probably don't get put to it. 
they talk about, hey, man, yeah, you got to see this 200 and something unit deal I sold down here or there or wherever, you know, so it's so it gets out. But um, uh, so tell us just real quick, briefly, we're kind of running out of time here, but tell us kind of where you all are headed. What what's what's the what does the future look like? Obviously, we hope it's it's prosperous and, and tons of money to be made. But what are you working on now and where is it headed? Yeah, right now we're doing a deal in Nashville. Um, you know, we've probably done, I think this will be our fourth deal in Nashville. We have five or six in DFW. We had a few in Minnesota that we've sold over the last couple of years. We're selling one in Fort Worth. I think, you know, for us, it's it's really just about buying solid deals in in growth markets and making sure that the sure. debt we're putting in place right now is cautious. Um, you know, can you somehow get a fixed rate loan? being where rates may go, you know, that's a big, big question mark on everyone's mind. And I don't know of anybody I've talked to that said, yeah, this is what's going to happen. So how can you still yeah. put your capital to work that is in the bank being eaten up by inflation that they're trying to tame while getting into investments that you're going to be able to sail through for a five to 10 year period and, and really make it grow. So that, that's where we're at. Sure. And, you know, there's no rush on our end. It's just buying great deals, um, making sure you're comfortable with your underwriting in these markets. Every market's a different market. You can't just underwrite yep. one deal in DFW and say that's how we underwrite in Nashville. It's a different market. And uh, just building your team. You know, so much of this business is team focus. You know, it's not just Mike and I at Granite Towers. You've got an accountant. You've got your asset manager. You've got all these brokers, investors, and and uh, CPA and, and SEC attorney. And it's just building a great team and, and buying great deals and great locations and then operating well through asset management. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot to yeah. it. And that's something that for listeners out there right now, if, if you know, I, I was making good money, you can try to go out and figure it all out or you can work with somebody or a crew or a company that's obsessively focused on doing one thing really well. And, um, you know, passive income, passive investors, it's, it's chuck your money and see how well the operator performs. So that's, that's something to think about if you do have extra cash or you're making good money, or maybe you have some equity in your home or 401k or an IRA, all those funds are good to go in these types of investments. Sure. Sure. Well, good deal. Well, listen, I want to, first off, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And um, I have a couple of questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just uh, for us to learn a little bit more about what you do and 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 uh, what what's important to you. But what is the best book that you have either recently read or are currently reading? Yeah, best book I've just recently read is Ray Dalio's book, The Changing World Order. Um, if you want a high level look of macroeconomics of where we are in the debt cycle and what's yeah. happened to past empires, dynasties, countries, um, that's a great book on history. There's no political, not red or blue. It's straight factual data of here's what's happened. Here's what's happened to currency. Here's where we are now. It gives you yeah. a better feeling of what's going on and makes you feel a little more comfortable in this time. Uh, yes, I would 100% agree. I, I started reading that, got laid it to the side to read uh, some other things, but it's definitely on my list to to come up very quickly. So, all mm -hmm. right. What is the best vacation that you have either taken or hope to take? Mm, man, that's a tough one. Uh, we went to Ireland with my kids uh, before COVID and it was just really fun. We drove the whole island and just had a great time. It was gorgeous. But then again, we just went to Hawaii to Disney, Alani, and <laughs> or and, and man, it was, it was a, it was so fun too. It was uh, pools yeah. and just hanging out by the beach, and you know, so I I don't know. I love vacations, but those are two that popped up that were great. Sure, awesome, man, awesome. Well, listen, how can the listeners reach out and get in touch with you if maybe they heard something they want to that resonated with them or something that they want to learn more about about you or Granite Towers? What? Yeah. Uh, how can they reach out and get in touch with you? Yeah, just go to our website. It's www.granitetowersequitygroup.com. And there's a contact us form. Just send us a message. You know, we can hop on a call, see if what we do would help you with where you're at and um, get on our mailing list and start seeing future deals. It's, yeah, just granitetowersequitygroup.com. Contact us. Awesome. Awesome. Dan, thank you so much for, for being here today. And listeners, if you liked uh, the, today's episode, go down and give us a five-star review. Please, please, please leave a review as well so that we know that we're doing the best job possible in order to bring you information that you need, want, and can use when it comes to your investment 
uh, choices or investment advice or whatever that you need from our episode. So, Dan, thank you so much. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.